All right, since uh, many flights in, into Beijing seem to be delayed recently, and uh, ours last night was, uh, was no exception. So I ended up getting into Beijing from Hong Kong at like 2 a.m. or something. So I figured it would be better to start a little later and, and, and actually, actually be awake. All right. So we have, I guess, three days of OpenCog stuff in, in this uh, AGI summer school. And there are, are three OpenCog people who have, have come. There, there's myself. There's Lake Watkins, who is, who is back there with the, the beard and the funny look on his face. And he's... Uh, he, Lake is part of the OpenCog team in Hong Kong. He's actually a, a game developer who is gradually transitioning into being more and more of an AI developer. So he's, he's, he's built much of the Uni 3D based game world that OpenCog controls an, an agent in, which is uh, something that, that he'll be showing you and talking about later on. And then Ray Ting, who is, who is there, is also working in the OpenCog Hong Kong team on natural language processing. So she'll, she'll talk about and give some demonstrations of the natural language parsing and semantics code and, and so forth from, from OpenCog. And then I, I will uh, go over the general OpenCog architecture and the ideas behind it and so forth. So the the sessions will be a mix of general discussion and then hands-on stuff. And for the for the hands-on stuff, you will notice that we, we have failed to bring with us anyone who, who was actually a, a super expert on working with the main OpenCog code base. Because as we'll see, OpenCog is somewhat modular. And I mean, I designed much of it. Lake has been working on the game engine aspect and then a part called embodiment, which communicates with the game engine. And Ray Ting has been working on language processing, which interacts with the, with the main system. So not, I, I did coding in the main system like a long, long, many, many years ago, actually close to a decade ago before we open sourced the thing as, as OpenCog. So however, Getting started with a system and doing simple things is pretty well covered by the the tutorials that, that Alex Vanderpeet from our Hong Kong team wrote. And if if there's any problems, Alex is on the same time zone. He should be able to troubleshoot from uh, from from afar by Skype or, or or chat or whatnot. So anyway, the plan is. Today, we'll basically talk about stuff. Tomorrow afternoon, we'll start to get into the actually doing simple things with, with, with the code. And then mo Monday, Monday actually, um, we'll, we'll just see how it goes. It, it, it'll, it'll be a mix of uh, going through tutorials and, and Discussing and, and presenting AI things. I mean, it's it's a fairly small group, so we can we can uh, we can we can kind of t take take it as it comes, I guess. So this uh, yeah, this this is the I guess the the third AGI summer school we've we've done, and each each one has been quite different in in character. So this this is the this is the first time it was done. Like split up into into completely different segments, and I there's an advantage to that, of course, in that each of us teachers only has to come to one segment. <laughs> I think in the in the previous ones it was a broader mix of topics with less depth on each topic. So I've I've actually never done like three days of of OpenCog before. And because I'm quite busy working on various things, 
I did not have time to make three days worth of, of presentation material. So, so however, I, I have a large amount of presentation material that I've created for other purposes. So I'll be, I'll be skipping through much of it and, and skipping irrelevant parts and going through the relevant parts. And much of this stuff we present for the first AGI summer school in Xiamen is, is actually still, still relevant now as, as well. So since it's a small group, I think we can keep things quite informal and uh, feel free to interrupt with questions or comments and uh, yeah there's I mean there's there's a fixed set of topics I want to cover but they could be covered at at, at various rates and various levels of, of, of depth so if, if we get sidetracked into interesting discussions on, on one or another thing it's uh, it's 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 not going to matter too much. I mean the part of my reason for coming to do this is just to spread knowledge about AGI and OpenCog, and, and another part is the hope to actually interest people in becoming involved with OpenCog and and helping us to further develop the system because it is a a large project being pursued by a small team of people at, at, the present, at the present time. And I mean, in the big picture, I think, once OpenCog or any AGI system has gotten to a sufficient level of functionality, where it does something that is, is palpably really awesome, at, at that point, it will be possible to get both funding and volunteer enthusiasm from a massive number of people and, and really see things explode. But in, in order to get to that point, we need to get an AGI system to the point where it actually does something that is, is interesting to people who are not researchers deep in, in, deeply embedded in the project. And to get to that sort of transition point, I think every, every little little bit counts. I mean, a few more people contributing could could be could be quite valuable. Oh, it's really hot in here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's not quite sauna level. But it's, uh, I think it's it's hotter here than it has been in Hong Kong. Although Hong Kong is more is more humid. Right? Hmm. So, yeah, this, actually, since there's so few people, why don't we go around, you've probably done this for the other instructors, but that doesn't matter since I wasn't here, go, go around and every, everyone take 10 or 15 seconds and tell me who you are and where you came from and, and so forth. Yeah. It could be 30 seconds, I don't know. But I, I, I will forget your name immediately after you say it, but the, the, the totality of the information will... will Sit in the back of my brain somewhere. Yeah, let's start over here then. Uh, hi, I'm Gao from Peking University. And uh, my major is natural language processing. So uh, I became uh, learning uh, AGI from the, the last year when I'm in the university. Uh, any problem about this school or basic, uh, you can ask, ask me and I will help you. Robot oil drilling platform. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, um, a guy named James Newton Thomas, who is going to be here for the Humanity Plus conference on Saturday, he's working in Australia on autonomous mining facilities. So not, not, it's not not out in, not out in the water. So it's 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 a little different, I guess, but it's a similar set of concepts. Yeah. Uh, my background is, uh, I'm from Beijing, 
My background is uh, biology and uh, that, animal medicine. Uh -huh. And I'm working for uh, Nestle Purina now. So it's a small group for the zone AOA. And it's, uh, my work is mainly on the feeding test. And on what, sir? Feeding test. Uh, it's kind of a sensory test uh -huh. for the food. Oh, okay. It's uh, not related to this area, but it's my interest. So I'm yeah. here to find, try to find answers for some questions in my in my mind. Sure. Normally, I find by far more questions. Yeah, yeah. Nice to meet you guys. Mm. Oh, my name is Lucy. Uh, mm. uh, I'm from. University. My name yeah. is uh, Mike uh, in the philosophy department, and I'm interested in uh, digital philosophy, digital philosophy, and uh, universal induction. Hello again. Um, my name is Lake Watkins. I'm from the United States. I um, don't have any master's or PhD degree in AI, but I've worked on AAA titles for the 360, PS3 also dozens of mobile games. So I'm your game guy, when you want to test AI, come to me. I'll talk to you guys later. Hi, I'm uh, Jonas de Vest, and I'm from Brussels, and I'm doing a PhD in philosophy. Um, specifically, it's a PhD on uh, tableau systems for modal logic, so not really related to AI. Uh, good morning, my name is Michael, from New Zealand Fulbright Programmer. Nothing interesting. <laughs> where, 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 where in New Zealand? New Zealand, Wellington, apparently. Yeah. Hi, my name is Yuan Jian. Uh, you can call me Ethan. And uh, I was living here. I got my PhD. I just got my PhD uh, degree in computer science. And uh, I'm measuring uh, the stupid network and systems. And I'm now working. Uh, hi. Uh, I'm Richard. I just graduated from Peking University as an undergraduate, and I'm going to study. Uh, I'm going uh, to become a PhD student in Northwestern University in Chicago. And I will. Uh, and uh, my mentor is uh, uh, will be Ken Forbes, and uh, our group will, uh, will work on like cognitive architecture, uh, cognitive modeling, and we will. And our focus is uh, more on high-level uh, human cognition, like analogy and qualitative reasoning. So. <coughs> Hello, my name is uh, Sergei Kolnov, and I'm from Moscow, from uh, Computer Center of Russian Academy of Science. I have uh, artificial intelligence uh, background for my master's degree and uh, I'm working uh, with uh, cognitive psychologists to try to formalize some of the uh, theories and some of the uh, findings. Uh, to, uh, my main uh, interest uh, is to integrate somehow this, uh, to see if uh, there are something useful uh, for AI in uh, cognitive psychology and uh, other uh, studies of uh, humans. Oops. <laughs> Hello, um, my name is Evie. Uh, you can call me Evie if you find the uh, Chinese pronunciation very difficult. And um, I did my PhD and postdoc uh, at the University of Kent uh, in England. Uh, and my subject uh, was using pattern recognition uh, in medical diagnosis uh, using um, hand drawn images and later uh, uh, digital paleography. Uh, um, and, and now um, I'm kind of a freelancer. I am a co-founder of a startup called WiseMed, and we are working on a crowdsourcing doctor solution. So uh, I'm looking for some uh, artificial intelligence or AGI solutions to, say, combine the uh, crowdsourced uh, opinion. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, oh, uh, by the way, I'm compiling a mailing list uh, for our class. Uh, because uh, we were talking about going out for lunch and then maybe uh, later to organize some uh, meals or something like that. So it would be nice to have a, a mailing list. So uh, I sent out an email uh, earlier. 
today. And if you're not on the list, please come to uh, come to talk to me. And uh, if you notice someone who's not in the class but on the list, please also uh, come and talk to me. Thanks. Hi, my name is Cosmo. I'm from Seattle. I own a software company called Channel Agility, and our company has offices in Manila and in Seattle. And our product forecasts and optimizes demand and pricing for products on the Amazon marketplace. I also studied at Singularity U last year, and I've been independently studying AGI, and I'd like to join and start contributing to the field. Hello everyone, my name is Matthew, I'm from California, I'm in the uh, financial and automotive industry, I'm here uh, as Ben invited me, and I'm curious to learn about the subject, it's always interested me. So, uh, hello everyone, my name is Yuling Jin Xu, I come from the University of School of Philosophy, <coughs> I'm teaching philosophy and I have been a teacher there for nine years, so I have I have been a professor for quite a long time. I basically took philosophy of artificial intelligence, philosophy of cognitive science, and in this sense, I am very interested in AGI. And I have been cooperating with uh, K1 for quite a long time. Now I came to attend this, this summer school to see other versions of AGI. I think uh, I needed to have a more comprehensive vision of AGI. Thank you. Yeah, sure. We can explain to you why, why Pei's logic doesn't work. It should be, <laughs> it should, it should, it should be interesting. Um, I'm Sophia. I'm a, a student at Temple University of Dr. Rollins. Um, and yeah, that's basically it. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I graduated from Temple in 1989, a long time ago. I don't miss North Philadelphia no. at all. <laughs> 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 I come from Tianjin University. Uh, my research field is semantic web. Uh, I got some information about AGA from NARS project last year uh, from uh, Wang Pei, Pei Wang's uh, lecture. So I think it is very interesting. Just Hello, my name is Gilles Rafael. I'm from Spain. I'm from the Institute Technological of Aragon. Uh, I work in application of artificial intelligence to cloud work. So I'm working now in natural language processing, and so my idea is to apply uh, open code of NAS in, the, in this field. Hello, I'm Rachel, and I'm a Uh, hi, I'm Radu. I'm doing a PhD in uh, Madrid in uh, multi agent systems. And I'm here for a conference that is um, upcoming after this event. So I co located this to learn a little bit about AGI in the meanwhile. And yeah, that's it. Hi, I'm Jordi. I'm originally from the Netherlands. Uh, but I currently work at the Icelandic Institute for Intelligent Machines uh, on machine learning with uh, Chris Torza. And in the fall, I'm going to start my PhD and work with Chris and Eric on their AGI architecture. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Zhang Ning Khan, and I'm from Beijing Jiaoping University. And uh, I'm an undergraduate student, and I'm, my major is technical communication. And I'm now applying for for a PhD or master degree degree program in US, and uh, my interest is in uh, artificial intelligence and uh, data mining. And I have built built a robot of my, myself. It is about navigation, and uh, later I will put it on my website. If you guys have interest in it, you can you can have a look at it, and that is all. Thank you. That's great. It does give me a better sense of, of who we have here. I got uh, more people than I would have thought on language processing, actually. So that's uh, that, 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 that's interesting. And uh, we have Ray Ting will go over some of our existing NLP tools in in detail. But that's that's actually an area where 
we, we're going to be doing quite active development in the in the next year because the way we, the way we're doing NLP and OpenCom now is sort of partly just conventional computational linguistics and partly AGI-ish, and we're trying to tra transform and, and improve the system. But the, there's always a balance in building this kind of thing between trying to get things to work in the immediate term to, to do stuff and then trying to do it in the, in, 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 in the, in the right way for, for long-term long uh, learning and autonomous system development and, 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 and so forth. So, yeah, one, one thing about AGI is that no one really, th there isn't really a common idea of what AGI means at, at any level of, of, of detail. So, I mean, each, each of the instructors of this summer school has, has their own I idea of it. And I guess... Shane Rag and Marcus Huda wrote a paper once listing 70-something definitions of intelligence from, from different parts of the scientific literature. And then, of course, they proposed their, their, their own at, at, at the end. But, I mean, I'm not sure that's necessarily a, a problem. I mean, as I often say, if, if you look at biology, I mean, there's no exact definition of what is life. And no one cares, right? I mean, sure. I mean, you could say life involves metabolism and reproduction, but is you know, is a virus life? If you if if you hack the DNA of some microorganism in some way, is it? Are you making it still life or not? I mean, the, just the exact definition of life and the life non-life boundary is not really something biologists waste their time about, and it's it's not obvious that the exact definition of intelligence. Really, really matters that that much. I mean, it, intelligence is sort of a, a folk psychology concept that emerged for people to informally talk about each other, and it's it's not clear how well it really holds up when you start using it across different species or different kinds of, of systems and so forth. I mean, it's it's still a useful thing to think about right now because it it helps us distinguish some software programs and machines from, say, toasters or Microsoft Word. But it's, it's not clear to me how foundational a concept it, it actually is. And if you, I mean, if you look at the three words of artificial general intelligence, I mean, for, for practical purposes, I, I conceive of AGI as the ability to achieve complex goals in complex environments. And that's simple enough, and you want to be able to have a variety of complex goals and a variety of environments. And you're assuming these are complex enough that people couldn't program in a giant switch statement with every possible case that the system will see. But when, when, you, really, when you really dig into it, there's problems with all three words in, in the acronym AGI, right? I mean, first of all, intelligence, no one really knows what, it, no one exactly knows what it means. I mean, you can talk about the ability to optimize functions or achieve rewards and so forth, but then there, there's limitations with each of those because really, to what extent does the human brain seek to optimize functions or achieve rewards or goals? I mean, some percentage of what we do is like that, right? But a lot of what we do is kind of wandering around randomly trying to figure out what's going on or just, just being... <laughs> being complex biological systems embedded in the world and not really trying to maximize a goal function or achieve a reward. Now, artificial, of course, an artifice is a tool, and if we're trying to build autonomous agents, we're not necessarily trying to build tools and maybe trying to create aut autonomous beings. Right? Now, general, I mean, one thing that's clear is to make a truly general intelligence in the sense of a system that could solve any, say, any computable problem in any computable environment, then that, that, that needs either infinitely or essentially infinitely much processing power. And if you look at Marcus Hooter's work on universal AI, he shows how in a few dozen lines of Lisp code, you could make 
an arbitrarily intelligent machine. So, in that sense, we're, we're all done. So, I don't know, has anyone talked about that stuff in the summer school? So, someone over at AIXI? Yes? Chris has mentioned how he doesn't generally like the approach. Did he tell you, do you know how it works? I have a big idea. Huh? Um, yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I mean, it's not a workable approach, but it's an interesting approach. So this is, it, it, what, what, what Marcus Hooter's approach shows you is that complete generality is not going to be achievable using finite resources. But if you have a huge amount of resources, it's actually surprisingly easy. So here, here's how AIXI works, which is also how Jürgen Schmidhuber's Gordon machine works, which is, it, it's, it's fairly clever, although hard to implement unless you have godlike powers or something. So, basically, between each action the system takes and each other action, the system does a search through the space of all possible computer programs. And it says, based on my history of everything I've done in the past, and everything I've seen in the past, based on my history, what is the program where if I use that program to operate myself, I would have maximized my reward and gotten my goals fulfilled best in the past. So what's the program where, where it, if I had run it in the past, I would have done best, right? And of all, the pro, of all the programs that are tied for that, so if you have, say, 100 programs, and each of them would have let you do equally well at achieving your goals in the past, had you been using them, you pick the shortest one. So you pick the most compact program that would have given you the maximal reward in achieving your goals had you been using that program to control your brain in the past. Then you run that program to control your next step. Then after taking that one more action, you go back again and search through all possible programs and find the one where, based on all the data you have, including the data of your new action and perception from the last nanosecond, you search through all programs and find the one where well, if you had been running that, you would have achieved your goal the best, right? And then you keep going. And, you know, he proves that... There's a, he, Marcus, what, what's the paper called? The, 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 fastest, most, the fastest, most effective possible algorithm for solving all possible problems. That's just it. The, the only problem is it's, it's fastest up to some constant factor, which is larger than everything in the universe. Right? <laughs> but that's just a constant, so that's just, you can brush it aside. Right? So, so, yeah, the problem with that approach is the step of searching through all possible programs, right? Because there's infinitely many possible programs. Now, there's, there's a, a dumbed-down version called AIXITL, TL meaning time and length. So then you only search through all programs that finish running within a certain amount of time and whose length is bounded by some amount. And that makes it possible to do, but still it's not feasible because, I mean, to search through all programs so of, of length less than... I don't know, uh, a, a million lines in runtime less than 10 seconds. I mean, you, you can't do that. There, there, there's too many such programs. So that, that kind of approach is completely general. And the problem is it requires an incredible amount of computing resources. Right? And so the idea these guys have is, okay, well, now we've done something. We've solved the problem of making AGI under the condition of a lot of resources. All we have to do is figure out how to optimize our algorithms a bit, and then we'll have a working AGI. Right? And, yeah, a, a lot of people don't, don't like that approach, but I mean, I think it, it comes out of the physics type way of thinking. Like, you know, when, when you do basic physics, first you study, like, how, how does something move if there's no friction and no air resistance, and every, everything is like a perfect sphere, and so and then then once you've solved the problem in that idealized case, th th then you deal with all the nasty little things in the real world. Huh? In this case, I, I kind of agree with uh, Kristen Thurston and, and Wang Pei that that probably isn't going to work for AI. And, but I think that, that tells you something interesting. It, it tells you that dealing with resource restrictions with the boundedness of time and space resources, 
is actually critical to intelligence. Like if if you lift the if you lift the restriction to do things efficiently, then AI and AGI are a trivial problem. And this this was really first understood by Ray Solomonoff in the late 1960s. I mean, his papers on Solomonoff induction, basically saying you could predict the future of a series of data by finding the shortest program that would produce the parts of the data you've seen, and then just letting that shortest program iterate. So what Huda and these guys did with the universal AI is taking Solomonoff induction and putting it in a setting of agents that take actions and get rewards. Right. So that, what that means is that this bit here of using, using limited computational resources is, is fairly critical. And it also is just an immediate consequence of building something in the physical world that we know now, because I mean, we do have we do have limited resources, right? I mean, this, 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 this ties in with the best explanation of the Fermi paradox that I know, actually. You, you know what the Fermi paradox is? This is the paradox of where are all the aliens out there? Like, the universe has been around for 14 billion years. So, how, how come when we send signals out, we don't get some little green guys in a spaceship coming here to give us lots of goodies and so forth? Or destroy us? Well, so John Smart, a friend of mine in California, had a good solution to that, which is tied in with the need of intelligence to use limited resources. So the, the idea is, as future AIs get smarter and smarter, they go beyond nanotech to femtotech, making intelligence out of little particles and so forth. You know, they, according to Einstein's special relativity theory, there's a limit to how fast information can go from point A to point B, which is the speed of light in a vacuum. So that means if you want to make yourself really, really smart, ultimately you need to compress your components really, really small together. So the amount of time it takes for information to go from one component to another is small. But if you get a huge amount of processing elements and mush them closer and closer together to have more information interchange, eventually you'll become a black hole. So that's, that's John Smart's solution to the Fermi paradox. So all the super AIs became black holes. Right? <laughs> and now uh, they, they may all be communicating with each other through quantum, quantum gravity wormholes between the black holes. And all of us who are too stupid to become black holes are still out here in, in the, the idiotic part of space. <laughs> Which, that's a theory that it makes a disturbing amount of sense. I mean, Probably our whole understanding of physics is wrong, since physics seems to revise its foundations every 50 or 100 years. So, so that, that may not seem to make sense in the physics we have 50 years from now. Who knows? But it's, it's kind of amusing. Yeah. So, yeah, to make an AGI, you want a system that can do a bunch of different things in a bunch of different environments using limited computing resources. In practice, it's got to be able to do things that weren't anticipated by its creators. So now this, this presentation that I started out with is actually what I gave at Singularity University like a couple of weeks ago, and is is probably too high level and non-technical for you guys who've been doing AGI for a while. So I'm going to go through it fairly rapidly just to give you a sense of how I look at how I look at, at the field overall and what we're doing. And then a after this, we will launch into more, more intricate open cog type stuff. So, yeah, as we all know, narrow AI, rather than AGI, is, is dominant. And for a reasonably good reason, because without that much work, you can code a specialized system to do interesting things, right? And if you talk to Peter Norvig, who was the head of, of AI research at Google for a long time, his job has been shifting now. I mean, what, what he thinks is you can just take specialized narrow AI components and kind of, once you have enough of them, you hook them together and you'll get a general AI. Now, I, I don't trust that at all. I mean, I think there's, there's a big, like, and then a miracle happens step there, right? I mean, so if you take, take these three examples, I mean, take... Google, I mean, they, they have loads and loads of AI researchers on staff. And it's 
a lot of their effort has been oriented toward making making it show you the right web pages when you type a query, making it show you ads that that you want to click on. Although I've never clicked on one, so someone must, or they wouldn't have so much money. And I mean, now they're they're working on the knowledge graph, which instead of just pages, will show you information pertinent to your query. So that that obviously requires a high level of intelligence of, of a certain sort to get all that information and of all that text. Then you have self-driving cars. That's one from the first DARPA grand challenge for driving in the desert. But now, now that's advancing a lot. And I mean, Google got pressed for their self-driving cars, but now, now major car makers are now doing the same thing. And it seems clear within a decade or so, you'll have automated cars dr driving uh, regularly on, on the street, which... Uh, yeah, it should make things safer, actually. And uh, I, I, I will appreciate it, since I hate wasting time commuting. I mean, I'd rather, sh rather sit in the car and work and let the car drive. Uh, and of course, uh, Deep Blue, which was the first uh, program to exceed the human level at, at chess. There's now pl plenty of programs that are better than the original Deep Blue. But So these are three fairly specialized things. The question is, if you have, like, a thousand of those, which are better than these, but still kind of vertical application specific, and hook those together, do you get something that's more like a human? And I, I think you don't, because I, I think you, you st in addition to those thousand specialized things, you need the thousand and first ingredient, which is the one that lets a specialized thing generalize itself beyond the domain it was, it was written for. And I don't see I mean, when you really dig into how things like this are built, I don't see how that's going to come out of them. I mean, there, there's, so in the way, there's two questions there. One is, one is, if the narrow things were built right, with a view toward eventual generality, could that happen? The other is, the way they're actually built in reality, could it happen? And I'm quite sure the answer to the latter question is no. Like, the way these things are actually built in reality you know, you always have a time constraint, you have a resource constraint, you want to keep things as simple as possible so you can get bugs out of the code and so forth. And the way you really end up building a narrow AI commercial application, as I know from building a lot, is you specialize it to whatever it has to do. And basically you'd be stupid not to because that's the cheaper way to do it. It's a way to make more reliable code and so forth. And that's just what happens. So you take something like Deep Blue, I mean, you don't make a general board game playing engine and specialize it to chess. You make a chess engine. Why? Because that's faster. And it's it's got to be able to go through the search trees really, really quickly. And I mean, if you change the rules to say Fisher Random Chess, which is a variant of chess where at the beginning of the game you permute the pieces in the back row randomly according to what some dice told you or something, and then, and then you play. So that that's an interesting variant of chess which was designed by. Grandmaster Bobby Fisher to eliminate the memorization of openings, basically, to make it more thinking instead of memorizing. But if Deep Blue wanted to play Fisher random chess, of course it, it's screwed, right? Because I mean, someone's got to go in and do brain surgery on Deep Blue. Whereas a human chess player, if you explain how Fisher random chess works, they could learn, right? And I mean, similar with uh, I mean Google. There's no way to teach it another language. I mean, you can't generalize like that. You can, of course, human beings can train it for another language by providing parallel corpuses of text and so forth. But a, a human being who had as much linguistic facility as Google, you could also t teach it a new language it didn't know before, and then it would point its knowledge over to that. Of course, that, 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 that doesn't work in this context. With the self-driving cars, think about if you had a human who could drive a car, how hard would it be for them to learn to drive a truck or a motorcycle? I mean, there's some transference of knowledge there. But if you take any of the current self-driving car software and hardware, I mean, to make that drive a truck or a motorcycle, you've got to reprogram a hell of a lot of things. I mean, the way, and that, the thing is that pervades the architecture. Like, the, take SLAM mapping, for example, the, the simultaneous localization mapping that you do in robotics, which is just making a probabilistic map of everything you see. I mean, the way you do that for a self-driving car, it's going to be conditional on the needs of a car. 
And if you had to make a slam map for a motorcycle, you would tune parameters differently. And this exact slam map used for a car would not give a motorcycle all the information it needed to turn. And it, in a way, it doesn't have to be that way. Like, you could make a general slam mapping facility and then happen to use it in your self-driving car. But it is, in practice, it's done that way because the goal is always to get the best possible self-driving car using the human resources and the, and the time and money that you have. So my, my, I think there's a pretty strong argument that in actual reality, the pursuit of no AI systems within a business context or within an academic context where you're trying to publish a paper in a certain amount of time, this leads you to make pretty specialized things that are well tuned for exactly what they're supposed to do. And it's an interesting and different research question whether if you are approaching these narrow domains and for each one trying to build something that could be generalized as easily as possible. If you were doing that, maybe connecting a bunch of thing, these things together could work in a, in a different way, but, but no, no one is going to do that. I mean, because that's a, that's an, that, that doesn't fulfill the immediate goals of, of building products. So, yeah, it was, it was with this in mind that my friend Bruce Klein and I organized the first AGI conference in, in 2006. And it's probably hard, m m most, m most of you are a lot younger than me, so it's, in fact, all of you. It's, it's, it's probably hard for you to appreciate how different the tone and climate in the AI field is now from 2005, when Bruce and I first organized this. Like it, in 2005, if you went into the AAAI conference or something, which is the, the main internet, or IJCAI, the main international AI conferences, and said you were working on building thinking machines that would think as well as people, there would be like three other weirdos who would be interested to talk about that. And everyone else would be like, yeah, well, they tried that in the 60s and 70s. It, it didn't work. Now we're doing real stuff. You know? I mean, there, there was just, you really couldn't get your foot in the door with, 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 with the original goals of the AI field at that point in time. In the last few years, for a variety of reasons, it, it, it is quite different. I mean, you, you have the keynote speakers at IJCAI or AAAI will acknowledge that working toward human level AI actually means something and is, is something that makes some sense to do. And you, you have, say, Daniel George will be the keynote at AGI, one of the keynotes at AGI 13. I mean, he's got 15 million in venture funding in Silicon Valley for a company where at least their marketing line is that they're trying to achieve human-like general intelligence. So that I, I have no reason to believe they're their work, albeit secretive, is not also going in, in that direction. I mean, they're, they're taking a vision processing approach. So when I last talked to them, they were going to start with object recognition. And once they solve that visual object recognition, move on to other AGI things. So I'm not sure that's the best approach. But just the fact that you now have like venture-funded companies which are explicitly oriented toward building thinking machines. I mean, that's... Uh, that wasn't there in 2005. What's, it wasn't there in 2010, for that matter. So we are, we are in an era of rapid change for a variety of reasons. I mean, I think the biggest reason is just the advance of underlying technologies in, in computer hardware and software, which has let, let more and more know AI things that evoke thoughts of AGI in people's minds get created, right? So the self-driving cars, I mean, I, IBM's Watson, all, all these things are out there in people's minds and they affect the way people think about these things. So from, from my point of view, IBM Watson is essentially a big expert system. Like it's, it's the same kind of thing people were building in the late 1970s, except it was a lot better computer hardware and software to, to pull it off now. And IBM devoted a big team to it. So, I mean, I'm, I'm not convinced Watson is a step forward toward AGI technologically. But in terms of psychology, these things change people's attitudes uh, to, a, to a great extent. And I think the, 
these changes in the popular attitude rub off into the research community to a, to a greater extent than most researchers would, would, would want to ad admit. So, I mean, have, having the general public think working on human level AI is not insane has probably helped to become more, more, more legitimate. So, I mean, we've, we've done these AGI conferences. Here's this one, AGI 13 in Beijing next, next uh, week. So, we, we, we've done these year on year. And I, I would say, it's been useful in kind of building a coherent community of AGI researchers. I mean, there's been no like amazing, observable, demonstrable breakthroughs presented at any of the conferences. So the, the journalists who come to them are always a bit befuddled with all the ab ab abstract work and ideas being presented. But I think when we started these in 2006, like none of us who were presenting there had any idea what the hell each other were doing. Like it was really just islands of people isolatedly trying to work on building thinking machines. And now, I would say many of us have kind of half a clue what each other are doing. I mean, it's it's still hard, and it's I mean, conferences. I mean, it's a standard modality for people to share ideas. But it's actually a hard modality for a field like AGI. Because if, if you compare it to, say, I've, I've also done work in bioinformatics, applying narrow AI to biological data, gene expression, and SNP data, and so forth. That is difficult also, but everyone's kind of working on the same thing, right? Like you, you have some particular set of data or some particular phenomenon in some organism. And you can have different theories or approaches to that, but at least you have this common thing in the physical world that you're all focusing on, and, and that, that enables common understanding. In AGI, you have, okay, OpenCog, we're building this software system with our own fairly nebulously defined set of goals. Pei is doing his own thing with his own nebulous set of goals. Christian is doing his thing. You know, there, there's a dozen other teams around building their own AGI systems, each with subtly different ambitions and each drawing inspiration from different parts of science. Could be mathematics, philosophy, biology, psychology, linguistics, engineering, wherever. So there's it's been very hard to even find a common vocabulary for talking about what we're doing. Like when, when one guy talks about perception he may mean something different than when someone else talks about per perception, for, for example. Like, where's the boundary between perception and, and cognition is not obvious at, at, at all, actually. And, I mean, language processing, again, how far into cognition does, does, that, does that pervade? Right? So some people distinguish learning and reasoning. Some people think learning is everything. And if a mind does reasoning, that's because it has learned to reason. And reasoning is it is a part of learning. So the, the way the words are used doesn't actually mean the same thing across different people in the field. And that's it. These conferences have not really solved that problem, but they've, they've helped us make some partial headway toward, toward solving that problem. So I'm, I'm in the process of trying to put together a multi-authored textbook on AGI, where different researchers wrote chapters on different aspects of the problem. And the, we're doing that in the background, but the, one of the bigger challenges there has been making a glossary for the book that everyone can agree to, because everyone, everyone wants to use words in, in particular ways. So it's uh, probably not an unprecedented struggle in, in the formation of, of, of new fields. But the, the, the other thing I would say is by, by positioning ourselves way out here, on the AGI end of the spectrum, I think we've helped the mainstream to be feel more comfortable doing doing some things with with with, with AGI. So just just like when when they started doing punk rock in the 1980s, they were, they were so loud and obnoxious. Everyone else could get away with being a little more loud and obnoxious in, in their music. So it's a, in addition to the direct value the AGI communities have, I, I think 
you influence the mainstream by 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 being out on on, on the extreme because then, then 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 when someone gives a keynote speech at Triple AI saying that they want to build human level thinking machines, they're not the craziest person out there anymore. So there's plenty of us who are crazier. Huh? <coughs> In 2009, we had a workshop at the University of Tennessee called the AGI Roadmap Workshop. And I'll talk about that in a little more depth uh, right after this presentation. But this, this was interesting in, in how limited its success was, I would say, to, to put it tactfully, since I'm on video. <laughs> um, there, there had been a workshop before that, organized by Pat Langley and John Laird, who were like two lions of, of good old-fashioned AI research who descended from Alan Newell and, and John McCarthy and all these old guys who founded AI in the, in the beginning. So that Laird and Langley had done a couple of workshops trying to bring together different researchers on human-level AI. They didn't call them AGI. And I would say... Those research, those workshops just really didn't gel. I mean, we had 12 researchers in the room, and the goal was to try to find some roadmap going forward that everyone could agree on. And uh, I mean, there may have been two of the 12 people in the room who agreed on something, but I, I don't remember what it was, if so. But b b by and large, the diversity of perspectives was was in incredible. I mean, it's a testament to, to human creativity, but it, w it wasn't helpful for coherently moving forward. I mean, f for example, Pat Langley and a number of others, I mean, they're building systems where basically to start off your system, you load in a bunch of knowledge from some file. So the system starts, say, say, say it was going to do something, do some reasoning about the AGI summer school. It would start with a list of the people in the room. In fact, people are sitting at desks. Desks have chairs near them. Desks are on the floor. You just start with a big file of all the knowledge it needs. And then there are many of us who think that, you know, that's not necessarily forbidden to do, but if that's at the center of your system, you're doing something wrong, and the center of your AI system has got to be learning from experience rather than getting knowledge from some file. And that, that's a quite foundational difference in, in how to proceed, actually. And then looking at embodiment, also there were some of us who thought an AI should perceive a world and act in a world, and others who thought that that was completely irrelevant, and basically you could load in formal axioms and just ask it formal, ask it formal questions in some formalized system, like feed, feed it knowledge, and then and ask it a question like, you know, is, is, is Ray Ting drinking water? And the answer is yes or no. And some of us felt that kind of framework just is not going to be useful. And you really want to s framework with a system in, in, in a world. You have a question? What Comment? Was, what's that first scenario and that last scenario there? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll we'll get to that. Okay. Yeah. So, so, one thing we tried to settle on we tried to settle on, okay, if we each have a different approach, can we at least settle on like some common environment or scenario or set of tasks, some, some common thing that all our different systems should do? And of course, we didn't manage to agree on that either because uh, each of us favored a scenario and a set of tasks on which our system would do better, I, I guess. I mean, I, of course, because if someone's been working on machine vision for 10 years, why would they want to embrace an AGI teaching scenario that didn't involve vision at all, right? So, so th this, this was a list of scenarios that we decided were interesting. So Sam Adams from IBM was a proponent of general video game learning. So w w what that means is you give the system a, a random video game. And in one variant, you can give it instructions. Some games, you wouldn't need instructions. And could it learn to play the game and do well at the game without, without the programmers like programming a separate gameplay program for each game? 
can it learn to play a new video game from experimenting and seeing what's going on? And the guys at a company called DeepMind in England now, run by Demis Hassabis, who's a quite good researcher, they are actually experimenting with this now. I mean, if, if you go to their lab in, in London, they've got like a, a screen with Pac-Man on it, a video camera pointed at the screen, and the comp their program is trying to learn to play simple games like that just by watching what happens. So they're doing vision processing from the computer screen. I don't think that I, I don't think they have a robot finger pushing the arrow keys. So I, I think that, but, but ba basically, they're trying to have the system learn simple video games just from experience. And to do that in general, I mean, I, I tend to agree that would require a high level of general intelligence. But with each of these scenarios, there's two different questions. One is, would succeeding at it prove that you had a really general intelligence? That's one question. Another question is, would working on that really be a good path to achieving general intelligence? And that's, uh, I'm less sure that working on general video game learning is a good path toward achieving general intelligence. Although I don't, I don't see any reason why it's a terrible one either, but I can see how it all depends on, on how you approach it. Like if, if you're starting with like 80s style games of Pac-Man, Space Invaders, Asteroids, Galaga, or whatnot, I mean, I could imagine you could make a system that was good at learning to play that kind of game, but was specialized to that kind of game. I wouldn't, wouldn't know what to do in, say, uh, w w World of Warcraft or Simtoons or something that's, that's utterly different. But yet, if you approach that task from the beginning with very broad generality in mind, maybe you'd come up with something interesting. I mean, Sam Adams isn't, in fact, working on that now, but it was an, it was an interesting idea. So, yeah, a preschool learning, I'll talk about a bit a little later, since that, that, that was the thing that interested me the most. And then, basically, the idea that if you could make a, either a robot or a virtual world toddler, that would have all the kinds of common sense learning and understanding that you really need to have as, as a basis for adult level AGI. Josh Abak was an advocate of basically video comprehension. Like what you wanted to do was like show, show a scene from a movie, then ask it what was going on. Like what, 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 who, who was talking, why, what were they saying, what was their motivation, where were they going? And, Figure if, if you could really answer questions in a flexible way about what was going on in the movie, I'm not sure it wouldn't have to take actions, but it would have to understand actions, right? And it would have to understand language and the relation of language to movement and so forth. And if that's a good enough task, then that means you could make an AGI without teaching it to move its hands and dealing with all the nastiness of, of robot actuation and, and, and so forth. And that, that's sort of, sort of an appealing idea. I don't think it's terrible. On the other hand, there's, there's a whole school in cognitive science which goes on the, the maxim by Heinz von Forster, the systems theorist, that if you want to see, learn how to act. In, in other words, von Forster and a bunch of these systems theory guys really believe that the way we learn to focus our attention and to fine tune our perceptual mechanisms is by knowing what we need to see in order to do what we need to do. And it's hard to argue against that as a neurobiological theory. I mean, there, there's loads of activity of pre-motor neurons in, 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 in perception. It's not just the perceptual cortices that do perception, it's the motor cortex too. On the other hand, an AGI doesn't have to do things exactly the same way as, as, as a human being. No. Reading comprehension, Stuart Shapiro, I believe, was the one who was championing this. He's going to be another keynote speaker at the upcoming AGI conference. I mean, he figured, why not just give it reading chess from third grade or whatever? And then, I mean, if it can read a bunch of stories and answer questions about it, then it must understand things. And my view on that is I, I think you could hack that. 
I mean, it would be a lot of work. But I think you could make like a Watson type system that, that could read third grade text and answer the questions about it. It would be an impressive and, and probably useful thing to do. But you just, you, you, you wonder if you're looking at texts within a certain delimited class, there's always the possibility of hacking things in, in, in some way. Now, reading comprehension of general English text, I think, you could not hack. That, that would be what you'd call AGI hard. Like, to do that, you would really need something that, that is capable of human-level general intelligence. But then it would have to be able to read, like, a, you know, a tweet or a Facebook post or some type of text that it hadn't encountered before. I mean, if you, if you took a third grade student and you showed them a legal document, they're not going to really be able to understand it fully unless they're some kind of child prodigy lawyer kid or something, but they're, they're going to be able to get something out, something out of it because they're not completely specialized in some particular kind of, of document. School learning, of course, that, that kind of comes out of, of, of preschool learning. Once you finish preschool, you should, you should go to school. And then uh, Steve Wozniak, at one point, and I think he may have changed his mind since then, but the co-founder of Apple, he made the statement, there will never be a robot that can go into a random house in the U.S. and make a cup of coffee. So, Josh Hall, Jay Storrs Hall, who was at this workshop, abstracted that as the coffee test. Like, if you had an a, a robot that could walk into the average American, any American house, figure out how to make a cup of coffee, I mean, assuming the materials are there, he figured that was the kind of general intelligence that you really need as a foundation. And, I mean, you know, the coffee, they could have coffee grounds and some jar up in the cupboard. They could have coffee beans. That, that you have to that you have to put in a grinder. There could be a really tight lid on the jar of coffee beans, and you have to like bag it on something to to get it to open. Right? I mean, there's and then when, once you get that machine, there may not be a manual for it. Right? You have to go to that machine and look at all the different buttons and doohickeys. You may have to plug it in. So there, there's the plug might have a switch by it. You have to turn it on. So, and all these particularities may be different in different people's houses, right? So, again, he was assuming he didn't solve this by, like, sending a team of a million people out to go in everyone's house and write a detailed instruction for, <laughs> for, for dealing with how to make coffee in every single house. We're assuming you do that with some, some reasonably compact methodology. And so the, the conceptual disconnect here was say, Josh Hall and maybe a couple others at this workshop really believe that, like, that's what matters. Like, until you have this basic perceptual, motor, embodied, grounded common sense, all the rest of this stuff is just meaninglessly shuffling symbols around without any knowledge of what the symbols refer to. So you just got to get that first. Otherwise, you're just messing around with abstract nonsense. It's not going to go anywhere. Whereas... What the guys advocating, say, reading comprehension or video game learning, what, 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 what these guys think is to oversimplify a bit that the perception and action are just kind of peripherals, right? And I mean, you, the crux of it is some abstract cognitive reasoning and learning facility. It doesn't really matter if you plug in like eyes and hands peripherals to it versus like a keyboard and screen peripheral to it. It's, it's all... And that, that, as far as I can tell, Pei Wang's view is very much the latter. Like, Pei believes it's all about logic. Like, there, there, there is a logic of, of thought which he has discovered. And then the important thing is getting that logic of thought down right. And then you can plug in all sorts of different peripherals to that for language or, or perception or action or, 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 or whatever. And the peripherals may be important for getting specific things done, but the crux of intelligence is in that cognitive center, that logic of thought, which is the traditional view of good old-fashioned AI in the U.S. going back many decades. But the view that Josh Hall had in proposing the Wozniak coffee test is exactly opposite, right? So it's, he, he thinks that core logic is something that emerged very late in evolution and it, it, it is a kind of 
two percent of what we do and is it kind of lives on top of all this other stuff that's much deeper and more interesting. So from from the embodied intelligence point of view, it, it's more like you know we share ninety five percent of our DNA with with chimps and gorillas and the, the, the chimps anyway. And the, these guys aren't very good at proving theorems or doing logic, right? I mean we. An awful lot of our brain is the same as the brain of a dog, basically. It's got all the same different parts doing basically the same things. So, in that view, if you got to an AI that could do what a dog does, let alone a monkey, you're basically there. Then all you have to do is figure out the little tweaks that evolution took to do the, the very last bit. And Josh had some specific suggestions about that. I mean, the, in his paper on AGI 10, I guess. I mean, the... No, AGI 9 in the one in DC. But the, the, the point there was he believes that by perception turning on itself recursively, you get cognition in essence. Once you have complex perception modality that has evolved, then perception perceiving its own perceiving process allows cognition to be built. And then you kind of get logic bootstrapped out of perception. So then trying to hand code a logic without that perception underlying it, you're going to get something that, that's very brittle and superficial and not going to have the power of the kind of logic that emerges from, from a perception system. And I mean, in favor of that, you would have the idea that no one has solved the problem of inference control in logic systems. I mean, logic is easy in one sense. If you specify a bunch of axioms, then you can derive conclusions from the premises, right? I mean, that, that's very simple if you know formal systems. On, on the other hand, how do you know which rules to apply at which point in time? That's the problem of inference control. No one can solve that even in mathematics. I mean, that, that's why there's no theorem-proving systems that can do unsupervised theorem-proving. I mean, Automatic theorem provers have been useful to mathematicians when used in a very carefully controlled way. I mean, you, you set up some special case of some math problem, and then you can guide an automated theorem prover to, to help you check a bunch of details. I mean, that's how the, the monster theorem, the classification theorem of finite simple groups was done that way which is probably the, one of the biggest theorems in the last 30 years, which probably no one knows what I'm talking about. But it's a, anyway, they've done great things with automated mathematics, but there's no AI system that can be a mathematician where you can just throw out an arbitrary theorem and say, prove this. And th the reason is that inference control is unsolved. How do you know what rules to apply in one order? And Arguably, if you had a reasoning system that emerged out of a perception system, this control of a reasoning system comes as an extension of the control of the perception system, which was honed by controlling perceiving things in the real world. Whereas if you built a logic system that didn't emerge from that perception system, you're kind of clueless about how to control it and, and direct it, and you can only solve small toy problems, or else solve problems in a very specific setting, like simple groups or, or circuit verification or, or, or something. So that's a... Uh, we had a good couple of days arguing all these points at the AGI roadmap workshop. I mean, what I've just given you is kind of a summary of some of the arguments that, 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 that we had there. And, but ultimately, we didn't come out of it with a common understanding of like what scenario would be good for AI, AGI research, and you can see why. Because if you think like Josh Hall, of course you're not going to want to just have something to read storybooks. But if you think like Stuart Shapiro, that you know perception and movement are kind of like digestion. They're they're just like infrastructure that's there to support the mind. Then of course you wouldn't want to mess with robots and all this meaningless stuff of eyes and arms. You just want to do the cognitive stuff, which is reading and understanding ideas. So, I mean, I had Itamar Arell and I handpicked the people who attended this all to be people who are into AGI, focused on learning from experience, and thought that embodiment, in some sense, was a reasonably good idea. 
But e even with that focus, th there's a very wide diversity. Now, we did agree on some things. And, uh, I mean, we had some agreement on the list of, of capabilities and competencies that an AI should have. L let me see. some things. Uh, so let, let me review some of the points of, of agreement that I told you all our arguments. So we, 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 we agreed on some goals that we would all agree we had succeeded. Like w w w when have you won? When have you gotten human level AGI, right? So we could somewhat agree on that more so than on what scenarios we should use to get there. Like it, none of us thought the Turing test was a terribly good approach in terms of Development. Like none of us wanted to drop our research and focus on winning the Lobner Prize, which is the annual prize for fooling judges into thinking your program is a human in conversation. But we all agreed that if, if you could make an AI that would fool humans in like an hour of text chat that it was a human, reliably fool educated humans that it was a human in an hour long text chat, that thing is generally intelligent. I mean, Five minute Turing test, you could fool people, or I mean, ver various settings. I mean, like on, on, on IRC or Twitter, you could fool people because that's a retarded projection of humanity anyway. But I mean, in a real like, one on one chat for an hour, you can't fool people that, that you're human if you're just a statistical or rule based chatbot. We, we all kind of believe that. No? Being able to do, do science, that seemed like another worthwhile goal. I mean, not not just to like run the lab equipment, but if if, if you could put the AI at, at, a, at a research question, like say what 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 is what, what is the role of the gene Fox zero in human longevity? Throw a research question like that, and it will you know read the literature about that, design experiments, run the experiments in the lab get the results of the experiments and write a paper on, on the results explaining why it helps answer the question. I mean, if you can do that, I, I think that, that counts as a general intelligence. So what's interesting there is it doesn't have to be human-like to do that, right? I mean, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't have to know what, you know, the feeling of, of rain feels like on, on, on your neck or what it feels like to have a stomach ache. Or it, it doesn't have to understand the sense of getting old and dying or something. It, it doesn't have to be human. But that, that kind of process is complex enough, involving a combination of enough different sorts of things to a broad enough goal. It seemed like that would count as, as human level general intelligence. University student. So not just taking tests, but I mean, if, if you had a robot that could come to Peking University and like, could deal with, with getting a badge to get in into Peking University in the first place and find the classroom, sit in the classroom, listen to the guy talking, understand when the exam is scheduled for, go take the test. You know, if, if the teacher grades him wrong, argue with the teacher, I mean, so, so forth. I mean, if it could do the whole thing to go to university, even if it was not a human in terms of having human-like emotions and so forth, that, 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 that should be accepted as a human level AGI. Uh, going back to the coffee test, a, a robot household servant, say a, a, a maid that can clean your house, walk, walk, walk your dog, change your light bulbs, do all the, all the mix of things you have to do to maintain the house based on the same verbal instructions that you would give a, a human helper. Again, e even though that's a job that we don't pay people much to do, that, that, that is something that clearly requires integration of perception, action, reasoning, and all, all sorts of, di of different things. So I think we at least could agree 
on a bunch of end goals that, that we all would accept as human level AGI. I mean, most of us also thought once you got to that point, you could make something much smarter. So that it's not like, not necessarily the end goal of, of AGI research. Because if, if you start thinking about it abstractly, I mean, you have a system that does nothing down here. You have a system like AIXI, which is up here at the infinite extent of unachievable intelligence. Then humans are somewhere in between. And the, the idea that humans will be at the maximum point of intelligence, it seems quite unlikely. I mean, just as unlikely as, as you know, is the cheetah the maximum possible runner? Can the cheetah run faster than anything else? I mean, probably not, right? Can the, can the bird that flies highest, is that the maximum height anything can fly? I'm, I'm, I'm sure not. So I'm sure human level intelligence is not the end. But it's, it's a lot further than where we are now. And these various scenarios I've, I've, I've been through. So one thing we did agree on, probably because it, it's not very interesting, is we agreed on a long list of competencies, meaning things that humans can do, which involve general intelligence. And there, this isn't, there's a series of pages like this, actually. In the, actually, I can send you all these presentations later if you're interested. So, I mean, but n none of this is too original, but going, going through it all, you see how many things we do and take for granted. I mean, we, of course, we can perceive in various senses. We can combine perceptions in various senses. We can perceive what our body is doing. We can actually, we can move our bodies. We can use a variety of different tools which current robots are bad at doing just because their, their hands aren't, aren't, aren't good. We can navigate. We have a lot of kinds of memory. I mean, we, we have both implicit and explicit memory. We have our short-term working memory and long-term memory. We have episodic memory of our life history. We have semantic memory of facts and beliefs. We can learn by reinforcement from what worked. We can also learn by, by imitating others. We learn by doing experiments, we learn by verbal interaction, we learn by reading. We can reason both in kind of pure logic, we can reason about naive physics. Like I, I, I can reason if I throw this up, it's probably going to come down. And all, all, all sorts of other basic physical things. We reason causally, we reason based on associations, we can plan on various time scales, both about physical things and social things. We modulate our attention. We create new goals and motivations. We can express and understand emotions. We can model our own minds and other people's minds to some extent. We can determine appropriate social behaviors in different contexts and then sometimes choose not to do them. But we can, we can communicate Verbally, we communicate with gestures. We can communicate with pictures. We can we can mime things and, and act out dramas. We can count things, compare sizes and, and weights of things. We can we can build things. And building things physically, we can build groups socially. We we can build ideas and so if you go through all those competencies. That lets you think about the different scenarios a bit. So e each, each of the competencies in that long list, if you really wanted to test, is your system being a human level AI, you would want to be able to test, like, can it do each of these things? And if, if you were taking a sort of narrow AI type approach to building an AGI by piecing together a bunch of small pieces, you could, like, build a separate module to do each of these things and try to glom them all together. No one is really trying to do that at the moment, although I think the SOAR and ACT-R approaches are coming close to that. But no one is really trying to do that. Everyone is trying to get some, some core underlying learning, reasoning, or understanding facility that they then learn to do all the things on the laundry list. With with the uh, exposure to the environment and with appropriate feedback. Yep. Do you distinguish between human level AI and human like AI? Um, occasionally, but not very systematically. Yeah. I mean, 
neither of them neither of them is precisely defined right I mean what, what is the, what is the human level <laughs> well um, I agree it's hard to define but it seems like you could be in some ways as intelligent as a human without uh, having things like uh, vision or touch or yeah. uh, all of these I, 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 qualitatively, I agree, and I mean, I've used both those words in, 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 in writing before, but if you really push me to define exactly what human level means, that becomes hard, right? I mean, human-like, at least, that, okay, that means similar to humans, right? So I guess if you, if you think very differently than people, but are much smarter than them, you, you wouldn't be human-like. Now, human level raises difficult problems, actually. Like, how, how do you compare such qualitatively different things? It's tricky. Like, so, I mean, some would say, like, dolphins are human level. But they're, better at, they're a lot better than us at doing 3D navigation. So how do you compare that to the fact that we're better at using tools? So it's, it's kind of tricky. I, I feel like if, if two intelligences are too different, then, then ranking whether on the same level is, is, is a problem. But as, I guess in, in, informal dis, in informal discourse, I think that that's a reasonable distinction. And formalizing what that means is an interesting problem. <laughs> yeah, so in, in the preschool environment, I went through and worked out specific, that's probably hard to see, but I went through and worked out specific tasks for each of those things. Like say, in preschool, of course, interactive verbal instructions, well, you could, you could have a specific task, like building a tower out of blocks or something, and let's say it can't do it well, and you tell it how to do it, and then it learns to do it better. Okay, that, that was inter interactive verbal instruction. Now, the, 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 theory of mind, so kind of model what someone else knows. Well, let's, let, 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 let's say that Cosmo left the room, and then I took this thing and hid it in the backpack. Then I ask Cosmo, where's the eraser? Now, if you have theory of mind, you would know that he didn't see me put that in the backpack because he was out of the room, unless he was peeking through the window. And then you, would, you wouldn't expect him to know where it is, right? Whereas a very young child, in most cases, will not make that distinction. They won't realize that because he was out in the room, he wouldn't know where this thing had been put while he was gone. And in the preschool setting, so you, you, you can figure out a test for that. So I, I won't go through all these because it, it becomes kind of boring, but for, 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 each of, for each of those competency areas, in each of those scenarios, so in the video game scenario, in the coffee making scenario, in the preschool scenario, in the reading scenario, for each of those scenarios, you can run through a lot of these competencies and figure out how to evaluate them in that scenario. Now, some of the scenarios don't cover all of them. Like in the re reading comprehension, you're not building stuff, right? But you do, you do have quantitative reasoning you have some planning in, in reading. They talk about reading strategies when you're teaching children to read. So, I mean, you can sort of work each of these things into each of those scenarios. And that, that long list of things is, is it's, it's boring, but it, it is, a, you know, it, it, it's a view of what is human level, human-like general intelligence. And that I think that that's interesting to think about as a contrast to this sort of Marcus Hood or universal AI point of view. Because from the universal AI point of view, like intelligence is the ability to maximize any computable reward function in any computable environment, right? And of course, you could argue whether that's general enough because you're making specific assumptions out of computability theory there. But that kind of very abstract learning in some ways goes way beyond what any human being could do. I mean, we're much stupider than that. If you, if you look at the average person out in the street, that person is not going to optimize an arbitrary reward function in an arbitrary computable environment, and they can't understand what that means in the first place. So this boring laundry list of competencies is more like what ordinary people can do, 
but there, there you're confronting the kind of limitation of the notion of general intelligence because that that whole list of things is kind of very human focused. And I mean, I, I wrote a paper once for Na a NASA workshop, like exploring <coughs> how would a mind be different if it had evolved, say in the world composed only of water, or like an intelligent gas cloud floating in, in Jupiter. And when you really think about it, we grew up in an environment composed of matter divided into solid objects, and discrete solid objects interacting with each other. And out of that, you get causality, right? I mean, the typical examples of causality are like billiard balls bumping into each other and so forth. And then our language is based on components constructed of components, constructed of components, right? Like letters going to words, going to sentences, going to paragraphs. So everything is about building blocks and composing things of discrete, of discrete components, right? Now, it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. I mean, you could imagine different, a different way of approaching things. And, and maybe that the language of dolphins is just continuous waveforms. Like when, when a dolphin looks at a surrounding, it can make like a 3D map of the wavelet transform of what it sees and just mail that to the other dolphin, which is probably a better way to describe what you saw than trying to list it as a series of, of, of discrete things. And then would a mind in that environment care that much about causality and counting and so forth? It's not, it's not clear, right? So it may be that the, the list of competencies characterizing human-like intelligence may be more than we realize specialized to the specific environments and tasks that we evolved to do. I mean, that's not bad. That, that, I mean, that, that's what we are, so it's what we're best suited to, to build. But we may sometimes exaggerate the generality of the way our brains and our minds operate. I mean, in some sense, in principle, we can learn anything, but in practice, with real world, like energy, space, and time constraints, there's a strong bias to what we can learn and not. And you can see that to extent from looking at mathematics. Like, how much of mathematics, however abstract it is, is generalized from space and time and language? I mean, it, I mean, it's the theory of surfaces and abstract spaces and even like when you do the math of infinite dimensional spaces, it's like hyperplanes and surfaces and intersections. It, it's all stuff that comes by analogy to our physical world. And then things like algebra are kind of extensions of language, of, of syntax, or special syntaxes for manipulating symbols. But the, the totality of mathematics is much more than these things that, that you can analogize to the physical world and to language. But we just aren't good at thinking about it, right? So, yeah, I think you do, ultimately, you have to think about AGI in practice. You have to think about it in terms of human-like AGI to some extent. Not, not that it has to have hands and fingers and the exact a 7 plus or minus 2 limitation on its short-term memory that human beings have. But when you abstract too far beyond the specifics of human-like AI, I, I think you're, you're losing most of the problem, in, 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 in fact. And I guess I would, I would have that argument with, uh, with Pei, if, if he were here. I, mean, I have many times, because he, he abstracts it really far to just some core, very abstract reasoning, and everything else is, is the peripherals. And I, I don't really think you can do that in practice. I mean, in, in theory you can. But in, in practice, I mean, you're going to get, if you try to formalize everything a human needs to do in some abstract language like NARS, I mean, setting aside the question of whether the NARS logic is right, which I think it isn't, but setting, setting aside that question, just that <laughs> once you have, like, say, 10 billion logical axioms representing what a human needs to know, like, what, what do you do with it? What, 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 is, what is the method of inference control that, that lets you figure out how to combine these 10 billion things with each other? I mean, that's a, it seems like that comes out of other parts of the mind which were 
somewhat specialized to do with certain in environments and, and, and tasks rather than coming out of a pure logic logic domain. Hmm? Yeah, we published an article based on that workshop, Mapping the Landscape of Human Level AGI, which kind of summarized the scenarios and competencies and so forth that I've, I've, I've described here. I mean, it was nice that AI Magazine published an article on AGI, just because AI Magazine is normally not happy with human level AI in general AI. But, uh, yeah, I've run through the best of my overview, the rest of my overview, rather. I don't know what is the best of it. So there's a number of approaches you could take to building AGI. And this isn't all of them. I mean, I've talked about the potential shortcomings of what I call narrow AI plus plus. Like take a bunch of narrow AIs, hook them together, get them to do something. And the math theory approach, this diagram comes from one of Marcus Hooter's papers. That's the, the universal AI type stuff. Where you start with infinitely big computers. <laughs> no. There's a brain emulation approach, which uh, I guess I probably know more about than the other instructors here because I've done computational neuroscience work. But partly because of doing a bunch of computational neuroscience, that's not the way I want to approach AGI because I think we don't know nearly enough about the brain now. I mean, like for, as, as one example, we typically model the brain as a neural network in computer science, a network of neurons. But, you know, there's a lot of glial cells in the brain, astrocytes and other types of glia. And these cells are very important to how the memory works. Like, they found you can take human glial cells and put them in a mouse's brain and make the mouse smarter. It's kind of cool, right? It makes memory better, anyway. So, I mean, clearly these other cells in the brain are doing something important, relevant to memory. We don't really know what. This is just coming out in the last few years. Then, no one has really the remotest clue how abstract knowledge is represented in, in the brain yet at, at this point. I mean, it's, neuroscience is quite interesting. It's just kind of at an earlier stage. I mean, I was, I did a project for a couple of years for a U.S. government agency trying to model how people spatially understand the world at, at the neural level. So you look at, in the hippocampus, heavily mediated by the medial temporal lobe, you have a kind of top-down 3D view of the brain, of, of the world, rather. So the, the, you know, like in the video game, you can get a top-down view and see the whole landscape from the top, like you get from a satellite. That's in the hippocampus. Then the parietal cortex has three different spatial maps face-centered, eye-centered, and eye-centered. And then the brain has all these connections, connecting these four different spatial maps to each other, where they all kind of keep coordinated with each other. Not perfectly, because we're not that good at navigating around anyway, but it, it, it kind of works. So I was trying to find, like, what, how does the brain store spatial relations, like, between? Or if, if, if you have, like, a, a convex, a convex shape, like that, and this is kind of surrounded by that. How is that represented in the brain, coordinating between all these different spatial maps? So if you were running in here and out, how do you coordinate these maps in, in terms of the concept of convexity? I mean, we're not close to being able to answer that, that question. I mean, we, we we're not decades away, I don't think, but we're certainly years away, and it's not clear what kind of brain imaging will be needed. The, the basic shortcoming is there's no method of measuring the brain that has a high spatial and temporal resolution both. Instead, to get a high spatial resolution, you must chop off the head, freeze the brain, slice it into little pieces, and scan each slice of the brain, which works very well at getting the molecular density at each point, and then the, the neuronal network you can reconstruct, but it's one point in time, right? In theory, if we knew physics well enough in practice, you could take the snaps out of the brain at one time point and extrapolate forward. Right? But of course, we can't do that in reality. 
if you want to measure dynamically what's happening in the brain, what can you do? You can do EEG or MEG, but that's just a few hundred samples from outside the skull. You can't really infer what's happening from that. You can do MRI or PET scanning, but again, you can't get more than half a second of, of time granularity. You, you, can't, you can't go lower than half a second. And most interesting thinking happens within half a second. So, and plus, you can't get down more than a millimeter cube or something. And there's a lot of neurons in the cubic millimeter. So, and then that, you cut up in the head and stick in electrodes and tetrodes and so on. But eventually, that, that causes the brain to stop working if you stick too many electrodes in, inside it. So, <coughs> I mean, we, can, we can try after class if you want. But, so, yeah, right now, I mean, there's just a measurement problem. And I think once, once the measurement problem is solved, and you can measure what happens in the brain with a high simultaneous spatial and temporal resolution, thus basically making a 3D movie of what's happening inside the brain. Once you get to that point, then you have amazing data that you could use as the first step in designing brain emulating AGIs. I mean, it's certainly not going to be immediate. It's going to be a horrendously complex data analysis and reconstruction problem, which will take many large teams of people around the world many years to solve. On the other hand, it's something that the world's governments will have motivation to pay to solve because everyone wants to solve neurological diseases and so forth. So that will become viable eventually. Now, I think now most people who claim to be pursuing brain emulation-based AI or AGI are either fooling themselves or fooling other people, or, or both. Right? I mean, for example, we have these deep learning networks, like David George will talk about at the AGI conference, or Itamar Aral, who's a close personal friend of mine at the University of Tennessee. And I'll talk about the Destin deep learning network a little later. We have these deep learning networks that are hierarchies of pattern recognition processors. Uh, yeah, Yu Ching was talking to me about J J Jeff Hawkins' HTM network, which is like that. Now, these are marketed as being how the brain works. And my view personally, which not everyone need to agree with, but is that these are at best sort of high level conceptual models of how the visual and auditory cortex work. And I mean, they, let's say the spatial mapping stuff I was talking about, that, that's not there. You, you don't have the hippocampus. So you, don't, you don't have the top-down map. You don't have the basal ganglia. You don't have the thalamus. I mean, you're missing all these parts of the brain that, that do a lot of, of useful things. As well as the olfactory cortex, which has tangled up combinatory connections rather than hierarchical connections. As well as the glia, right? All you have are formal neurons and approximations of the formal neurons. So, I mean, it seems like what people do is take a very limited approximate view of one part of the brain and say, well, I got this to do something, which is, which is cool. And then, therefore, I can get this to do everything the brain does. So, what I think personally is when eventually a brain emulation AI comes out, it's not going to be like one simple thing, like an HCM hierarchical network. It's going to be like 50 or 100 things like that, which are all connected together and tuned to work together in some specific way, because the different parts of the brain have different architectures and, and different dynamics to them. I mean, more like the body. I mean, there's, there's no one architecture for the body. Like, the stomach is its own architecture. The, the liver is its own architecture. The immune system is its own architecture. Yeah, of course, there's commonalities. They're based on the same cells and, and, and the same DNA, and they all communicate together. But I think the different parts of the brain are going to be found to be more like that. I mean, they all use neurons and, and, and glia and, and blood and so forth, but they're, they're built in, in quite different ways. And I mean, I think th this is a story that will unfold in the next few decades. Like, we, we, we will all live to see it done unless we get uh, unlucky in, in some way. So, definitely not a bad approach. Uh, but, like, if, if we were going to try to make an AGI in the next five or ten years, which is what I would like to do, I think that 
isn't the way to do it because the brain imaging isn't there to give us the data we would need. Now, if someone has an amazing idea for a breakthrough in brain imaging, that, that would be very cool. I mean, what Ed Borden is doing with optogenetics is interesting. But again, getting neurons to fl fl fluoresce based on modified DNA, so you can look at what they're doing. But that's only working for a few cells at a time, though. So it's not extending to the whole brain. So, so the coolest idea I heard there, which is still at an early stage, sort of France was doing this, you, you drill a hole in the head and put a bunch of carbon nanotubes, like snake them into the head. And then, because they're carbon, the neurons like to grow around the carbon nanotubes. And, th and then, you, then you have the measurement all over the place in the brain. Now, of course, they're testing this on animals, as far as I know, not, not on humans. But, but uh, yeah, that, I mean, there's obvious risks there, like you're cutting open the head and shooting a huge amount of foreign material into the brain. But that approach didn't seem to have promise and that you're, you're getting like measurement apparatus all through there, right? Whether one would hope that you could do something a little bit less invasive than that. Like the, the skull is a big problem, but maybe if you like drill a hole in the skull and then just put like one device through the hole, that, then it could send some kind of electromagnetic radiation out through the inside of the skull and, and capture what's going on or something. I mean, there's, there, there's definitely directions that could work there. That kind of research goes slower than it could because of all these irritating moral and legal restrictions <laughs> of drilling holes in people's heads. <laughs> I mean, there are people who trepanate, just drill a hole in their forehead just for fun because they they say that the, the fresh air in your brain gives you some kind of <laughs> spiritual exaltation. So maybe you can get those people to cooperate with research and it would accelerate things. Right? In any case, those are the obstacles there. It, it's a very interesting... I think there should be more cross-pollination between computational neuroscience and AGI. I mean, it's a, it's a good thing. And as one example of that, where it would have helped, you know, when I first started working at neuroscience in, in the mid-90s. I was at University of Western Australia in Perth as a research fellow in the psychology department, actually. Though my orig originally my PhD is in math, but I was doing psychology at, at that time. And, you know, I was really annoyed that the biologists all said the brain could never grow new neurons or new, new synapses. Because with the neural net models I was playing with at the time, it was clear they could learn better if occasionally they could grow new synapses or new neurons. And so I argued with the biologists and the neuropsychologists there, like, well, yeah, but, you know, learning would work better if now and then new synapses or neurons could be added to the network. I mean, not all the time, but sometimes, right? And they're like, yeah, but that's not what we see. So the brain must do it a different way. So, like, three or four years later, there's all these papers on synaptogenesis, on new, new synapses, connections with neurons going in the brain. Five years after that, okay, neurogenesis occurs in the adult brain. So, in that case, from an AI point of view, not just me, but I'm sure many others, could see, like, this would be really useful if it happened from a theory, per, learning theory perspective. And if there were more connections between the two fields, the biologists could have said, well, okay, AI people, maybe you understand something. We should look really hard to see if, if neurogenesis and synaptogenesis are happening. Of course, that's not how it happened. Biologists just found it once their tools for measuring things got, got a little better. But that, that, that's an example of how the feedback could go from AI to, to biology in terms of AI and cognitive science seeing what properties of the brain would be really helpful for making learning to work, then biologists could guide experiments to some extent in, in that direction. That, that doesn't happen very much. <coughs> and I would say the way AI people use neuroscience is also usually pretty bad. Like you just cherry pick one thing that kind of seems to make sense and build an architecture based on that and ignore everything else. I mean, I understand why you do that because it's insanely complicated. Like it, if you look at the graduate text of, of neuroscience, it's like you get a book <coughs> with maybe 1,500 pages, 
And each chapter is, in essence, a high-level, like, executive summary or abstract of what's known about some part of the brain. And if you read all the papers at the end of that, it's going to be like, read a hundred papers extra. So you're going to be reading, like, five or six thousand pages of very difficult text to get a basic overview of how the brain works. Of what we know now, let alone what we don't know now. Right? And maybe eventually there'll be a grand unified theory that will make it all seem simple. I doubt it. I think it's just a mess. I mean, it's, a, it's an evolved system, and it evolved by glomming new things onto the old things over and over and over, and then the old things kind of adapted to work a bit with the new things. I mean, it's, it's, it's just a huge mess. I mean, I know one of, one of my friends in New Zealand who, who well, he's in Hong Kong. He's from New Zealand. He used to work on OpenCog. He, he, was, he, he was converted away from Christianity by studying too much evolutionary biology. He was just like, you know, this body, the human body is such a horrible, hacked together mess. There, there's, no, there's no way an all powerful God would, would make something this stupid. It must have evolved by some haphazard process. Which may say more about his psychology than about anything else, but it's a, it, it, it is a big, messy, complex system, and we're moving toward the ability to emulate it, but not that fast. And the, the, the other thing that this approach has against it at the moment is the hardware we have isn't really very much like the wetware that we have inside our heads. So you can simulate anything on anything as long as each of those things has universal Turing capability. I mean, that, that's a lesson from theoretical computer science. But, but to, simulate, to simulate, say, a calculator on a human brain is difficult, let alone to simulate a complex AGI architecture. And by the same token, to simulate neurons and glia and so on on von Neumann computers and distributed networks like we have now, is a pain. I mean, it's, 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 in, it's inefficient, right? Because the brain evolved for a situation where adding new components is really cheap. And each component doesn't have to work very fast or very reliably. Whereas computers were designed in a situation where adding new components is expensive, but we can make each component work fast and, and reliably. So there, there are different sorts of infrastructures. So there's, there's a certain constant, but large constant penalty that you pay in, in order to simulate one kind of process on a different kind of hardware. And what, what that means, very broadly speaking, is that it's harder to get a brain to work on a computer than to get a non-brain-like AGI to work on, on, on a computer. I mean, all else aside, if you're building a non-brain-like AGI, you can tailor it to the hardware you have. And you can't really tailor a brain to the hardware you have because you're trying to make it work like a brain. Right? Yep? Uh, isn't, I think it's IBM that's working on creating chips designed to run artificial neural A lot of people are, yeah. I mean, a guy named Kwabina Borahan, an African guy at Stanford, has been doing that for, for years. But these, I mean, these embody very simplified assumptions. Like there's no there's no glue, for example. There's no neurotransmitters. So I mean like if if you I mean, look at how drugs impact the human brain or say exercise or mood impacts the human brain. This is by modulating the levels of neurotransmitters in different parts of the brain. And that's not there on any of these chips because they're just like formal neurons sending electricity among each other. So if yeah, if you believe that the brain is effectively modeled as a sort of formal neural network, then either Bohan's brain chips or the IBM's brain chips or other things along those lines could be quite interesting. But I, I think, to me, there's more future in taking specific AGI architectures that were brain-inspired and designing chips just for them, actually. Because then at, at least you know what the chip should be doing. Like the, say, take Hawkins' HGM architecture. Ichimar Arell, who has Destin, which is kind of HGM-like, 
he's an electrical engineer, and he has an IARPA grant now, a grant from a U.S. research funding agency, to make a deep learning-based chip. So he's basically taking his hierarchical pattern recognition architecture and wants to put that on a chip specifically. And it's not even that neural network like, but it's it's sub symbolic. It's a bunch of small small autonomous processing elements recognizing patterns arranged in a hierarchy. And that architecture already can recognize patterns in data. And now he's making a chip just for that. And that whether that leads to AGI or not, it seems like it'll lead to something useful. So I'm a little more optimistic about that than about trying to make a brain chip, per se, that, that's based on a very partial model of, of how the brain works. I mean, the, the problem with building chips is it's, it's expensive, right? So, I mean, certainly everything will run faster if you build a chip for it. But, I mean, it, it takes a few years to make the prototype of the chip, and then you have to get someone to pay a mass amount of money to, to produce the chip at, 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 at scale. But I guess when we or OpenCog or anyone else figures out all the details of how to make a thinking machine that actually works, at that point, you could put that on the chip, and you know you, would, you could scale it up, scale it up quite massively. But my, my own feeling is it's going to be better to try to get intelligent behavior first so that you actually know what you want to put on the chip. Now, the, the counter argument would be if the actual algorithms and structures and dynamics needed are very simple, and all that's needed is more scale, right? And so then by taking a very simple thing and putting on a chip, you could scale it up massively, and then magic will happen. Now, I. I, I doubt that's going to happen, but you can't you can't really you can't rule it out. So it's uh, I mean the, the only only argument against that kind of research is it's so slow and expensive. Right? <laughs> yep. Actually, I missed the end of that because of that noise, right? Yeah. So I was saying, trying to emulate the brain, is, isn't it just like looking what is the circuitry in the computer, let's say, like the transistor and electricity flowing, while, while you're trying to learn is basically... Well, um, the thing is that, 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 that there's, a lot of, there's a lot of questions there. So what, 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 one, one point, which I know isn't, is not even the main point you're giving at, one point is that because we built the computer, we know what's the right level to look at. So at least we know what we want to look at is, is the circuitry, right? In the, in the brain, we don't quite know. Do we want to look at the cells? Do we want to look at the molecules? I mean, some people think you have to look at like, the microtubules and the quantum dynamics inside the cell wall and so forth. So we don't even know what is the right level that's the analog to the circuitry to look at yet, although we have some fair guesses. I mean, the other thing, the intent of your question is more like, yeah, are we... If you have a computer running Microsoft Word or something, then to, 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 study, to study the flow of bits through the chip while it's running Microsoft Word, it may be quite difficult to reverse engineer Microsoft Word from that flow of, of bits. And I, I think that's half true, because I think that Microsoft Word didn't evolve out of simpler systems that were adapted to make use of, of that hardware, right? So it, 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 is, it is a little different because, I mean, even a one-celled organism has some type of intelligence, which is in some way now just a human intelligence. It's going around trying to get food and find a more favorable environment. So I, I, I would say that we did... We, we, we did... the. the Cognitive software running in the brain is much more tightly adapted to the wetware because of the way evolution happened than current software is, is to the current hardware. So it's it's a. Uh, I tend to agree with that point of view, but I have to admit it, it's the, the analogy can be chipped away if, if 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 you if you really wanted to and. Of course, neuroscience isn't taking such a simplistic point of view, right? I mean, there's cognitive neuroscience. N neuroscientists are 
trying to work from a neuropsychology point of view and understand how the whole thing works as well as the micro level. So you look at the example of, of space mapping in the, in the hippocampus. I mean, yeah, we're looking at the cells, but the hippocampus has grid cells, so we know it has a triangular grid. So now we know the top-down view of the world that the human gets is a, a triangular grid, and we know which cells represent which parts of that triangular grid and convey the information to the parietal cortex. So we, we are working now on, on multiple levels, right? We're, we're working from the, the cognitive level all the way down to the cellular and, and molecular level. So I think, in principle, that would be a really hard thing to do, to reverse engineer everything just from the connectivity and the molecular concentrations. Well, I mean, Markham isn't that naive either. I mean, he, he is, I mean, I, I know him a bit. He's, he, he, he is very good at, at getting funding and very good at doing research. And he, he understands the complex relations between those things. So, I mean, I, I think he, that project may not achieve the exact goals they set out to, but I'm sure there will be a lot of cool science done uh, anyway. Right. So, I don't know what, is, is the schedule here that we're supposed to finish at noon? Is that, is that why these things are, are rolling up? Or is that just random? Well, what, 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 is, what, is, what is the deal with lunch with the summer school? Does everyone have lunch at the same place? Or is it a certain time or what? No? no? Okay, half past 11 to 2. Okay. Yeah, I paid no attention to the oh. schedule at all. Huh? Yeah, yeah, we started late. All right, so yeah, if we, if we end a little later and start a little later, no one will care then. All right, all right I'll, I'll, I think I'll keep going till about 12.30 and then we'll break for lunch. And I just as well finish this basic presentation. Yeah. Anyway, I'm not hungry yet. Yeah, yeah so... Apart from these approaches, there's a computer science approach, and again, this slide doesn't list every possible approach. I mean, it, the approach I'm advocating, I would call an integrative computer science approach, where we're taking many different algorithms and structures and trying to get them to all work together. Now, you can also have a more like one algorithm approach, which is actually pretty common in computer science. People think there's one algorithm of thought. I mean, I, I would put Pei Wang's approach in, in, in that category. It's, uh, he thinks he's got the one true logic of intelligence, and that one true logic is at the center, and if you implement that scalably and surround it with the right other things, then, then, then it, will, it will work. And then there's, I mean, the, the approach that Christian uh, Thurston and Eric Niva and these guys in, in Iceland are taking also doesn't quite fit into any of these boxes here because that, that, that's kind of a self-organizing distributed learning system which is not closely based on the brain nor is it really closely based on artificial life or evolution but it's a, it's a self-organizing system which in principle if exposed to the right stimuli could develop the structures of intelligence within itself. And I, I think that, that approach is super cool. I'm glad some people are doing it. I, mean, I, I built systems like that much worse than theirs, probably, in the 1990s, when I first learned to program in Haskell. And that, that was very fun. I, I guess eventually I came to the conclusion it was just too hard to predict and understand what a system like that was, was going to do. Like It, it seemed like with a lot of work, you could coax it to do simple things. And it's just a really difficult problem to a large self-organizing network like that to self-organize into the structures that you want. I mean, I guess you'd want to start with really simple organisms and like make a self-organizing amoeba and, and build up or something. So I, I, I think that that's quite cool. Eventually, I, I became convinced that it would work better to take a more direct approach, but I think that approach is is potentially viable too. I'm glad someone's doing it. Yeah. Uh, I'm just wondering where we did the lidar architecture because they seem to start from the brain and take to the 
Uh, why that doesn't have much to do with the brain? Uh, it comes from comes from cognitive science, really. I mean. Well, that's true. I mean, I can find neural correlates of anything. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I think L LIDAR is... I, anyway, I, I would put I that here. But, I mean, dividing things into boxes is not very interesting anyway. But, I mean, I, I would say LIDAR came out of Bernie Barnes and his global workspace theory, which is really psychology. It came out of cognitive science rather than neuroscience. And then they've done a good job of connecting different components of LIDAR with what parts of the brain are currently thought to do those things. But the thing is, if, if, if neuroscience changed and they decided, oh, well, this component is carried out in this part of the posterior parietal cortex instead of here in the anterior cingulate gyrus, the lighter architecture isn't going to change, right? So, I mean, it's, it, it's not tied that closely to how the brain works, really. I mean, but, I mean, the neuroscience played a role in shaping, in shaping the cognitive science that they use. But there's sort of, a, I think there's a level of, of indirection there. Because, I mean, they don't, they use, the reason I would call that integrative, actually, is at least until the latest revision of LIDA, each component of LIDA used quite different data structures and, and algorithms inside it. I mean, I know now they're trying to use, like, these sparse associative networks inside each component. But historically, the way Stan Franklin did it, each component was pretty separate and using m mostly, I mean, he, they use like Douglas Hofstadter's slip net for one thing, right? It was, it was quite a heterogeneous integration of different different things, n none of which worked much like the brain, really. So, now a very high level view of, of OpenCog. So, and this like 15, 20 minute review of OpenCOG, then we'll go into more detail after lunch. But I mean, it's, it is an open source software project, so it's code on, on GitHub. And while the code isn't all perfect, I mean, the, the essential framework was designed by actual software engineers who had worked on commercial projects. So it is, it, it is, it is different as a code base then code like built by a graduate student for their thesis or something like it, it, it uses good programming practices. It's divided into modules. It's, it's reasonably documented. There, there's not horrible bugs in it. And it, it, it is made so that you can add new modules on it to do different things without having to re-architect the core system and so forth. So it is, I mean, it definitely needs work as, as a code base, but it's a, uh, I think it, it is a reasonably professionally engineered code base that's been built so that parts can be improved without having to replace everything. Like right, right now, we may need to re-architect some of the core memory store in order to make better use of multiple threads and multiple machines. But if we do that, that's all hidden behind a certain API. It won't change people's AI code, for, for, for example. And if you wanted to add, say, a new kind of reasoning algorithm to it, you could add that, wrap it in a certain kind of object called a mind agent, and it would then interact with the, the knowledge base, which is called the atom space, using a certain API. And there's fairly, fairly clean interfaces for these things. Not always as simple as it could be, but I think it's, a, it's still a different situation than most AI projects which are built in a university context with a view of getting, getting research papers. And I think LIDA has improved, and that, that's also a pretty decent code base now as, as, as well. Right? So, yeah, the, most of the information about OpenCOG is on the OpenCOG wiki site. There's also this book, which the title has been changed around many times, which I finally finished writing like three weeks ago or something, which I... I posted, I, I'm not publicly releasing it, but I, I've, I've posted that on the internal wiki site. So even if you, you haven't had time to look at it while you're here, you can, you can download it and torture yourself with it afterwards if, if, if you feel like it. Right. So OpenCOG is fairly, fairly broad. I mean, the OpenCOG software framework 
could be used for a lot of different things. I mean, that, that could be used to, we are using it as basically a toolkit to build various commercial applications. So we, we have, we've used parts of it to do analysis of biological data. And we have a, a company in Hong Kong called IDEA, which is a hedge fund. So we, we're using components of OpenCog integrated within a, a application-specific architecture. We're using those components to predict the Hong Kong stock market based on price, news, and economic and fundamental inputs. And that, that's basically using OpenCog as a software toolkit, which is fine. You could use OpenCog to implement NARS if you want to, actually. I mean, you could, you could make link types in OpenCog's knowledge base corresponding to NARS links and implement the NARS logic as an OpenCog mind agent running there. No, that would actually have scalability advantages over Pay's current implementation, but we're not particularly moved to do that. But the point is you could use OpenCog as a toolkit or a framework if you wanted to. <coughs> what I'm going to talk about mostly here is using OpenCog as a platform for building a thinking machine according to a particular design, which I've called Cog Prime, until I come up with a better name. But, and that, that is a cognitive architecture that could be implemented in a different software framework than OpenCog. On the other hand, the Cog Prime cognitive architecture is kind of co-evolved with the OpenCog software framework, so that they fit pretty naturally together. And <coughs> One thing at a very high level, it supports both goal-oriented learning and non-goal-driven learning. So I think a large part of intelligence is goal-driven. We use perception, memory to predict what actions will achieve our goals. But not all of what we do is goal-oriented. I mean, I mean, people can fundamentally change their goals during the course of their lives, for that, for that matter. That's much of what development as, as a human being is about. And then you have kind of a complex, chaotic, self-organizing network in, in the brain, in the mind, and new goals can emerge out of that. All sorts of new things can emerge out of that. And I think you need both of these aspects, actually. You could say that the goals just emerge from the self-organizing mess. But I'm not sure that's the best point of view to take in building an AI system, because, I mean, evolution Evolution does enforce a certain goal-oriented aspect on, on all of us. Like we, we, we need to propagate our DNA. We need to get energy and not get killed and so forth. And so that, that does make us, to some extent, goal-oriented, even though these large cortexes that have evolved have all sorts of activations spreading around in them in, in weird ways that can deviate from the evolutionary goal-oriented aspect considerably. So I think both of these aspects are important to look at. Um, again, in my general philosophy of having it both ways, we have a, a knowledge representation in OpenCog that tries to be both symbolic and sub-symbolic at the same time. I mean, as, as you see in the OpenCog architecture, I, I don't like to make difficult choices. So whenever you could do things one way or the other, I say, okay, let's do things both ways. <laughs> Which makes things really complicated, but on the other hand, you're not leaving anything out. It's not quite that extreme, but th th there is that aspect to the architecture. So we have a knowledge base called the atom space. You have a bunch of nodes and links. Each has different types. And after lunch, I'll go over some of the specifics of that. But the point I want to make for now is some knowledge is encoded specifically in nodes and links, like in individual nodes and links. You could have a node for a table, a node for a specific table, an inheritance link between a specific table and the whole table, kind of like in Mars. You could also have knowledge that's represented in an activity pattern over a whole part of the network, which is more like in a more like in the Icelandic guys framework or in, say, the tractor neural network, where some of the knowledge can be in a pattern of activation among nodes that have no names and no obvious individual meaning. And that <coughs> seems to be no problem when both of these things exist in, 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 in the same network. But it's not necessarily brain-like. I mean, it, it's, it's a specifically engineered system. So this just shows a bunch of nodes and links that are explicit. Like, 
you could have a word node for the word cat, a concept node for the concept of, of cat, a reference link from the word node to the concept node, a, a Hebbian link denoting association between the, the cat concept node, is that it? And the jazz concept node, because cat is associated with jazz. Because in an obsolete vernacular, people who like jazz were called hepcats and so forth, right? So you can have nodes and links with specific types, basically representing logic. And it's a particular logic, which I'll explain later. Basically representing logic in the node and link framework. And you could represent a variety of logics in that node and link framework. On the other hand, you also have a kind of fuzzy or high-level representation. So, so this could be a bunch of nodes and links all about chickens. This is a bunch of nodes and links all about food. Then you may have multiple links spreading from chicken nodes to food nodes. Like, oh, people eat chickens, chickens eat food, and so forth. <coughs> so then what could happen is when you have some activity in the chicken nodes and links, along a bu for a bunch of different reasons, that causes some activity in the food nodes and links. And that's a sort of more general flow of activity, which is like in an attractor neural network. And you can have both of those in the same network. I mean, this, this kind of network with both symbolic and sub-symbolic knowledge in the same network I've been working with since about 1996, when I was in the University of Western Australia. So that, that core representation was there in some prototypes I built. <coughs> it was there in the the WebMind AI engine that we had in the company, WebMind Incorporated, which existed in New York from 98 to 2001. It was there in the Novamente Cognition engine, which we then open sourced part of to form OpenCog. And that, that's a, I mean, it's a specific choice about how to do things, which says we're not going to take a purely symbolic logic approach and then have a logical core and view all the sub-symbolic stuff as peripherals. <laughs> Nor are we going to take a purely sub-symbolic approach and want all the logic stuff to emerge from it, which could happen, certainly. Instead, we're going to explicitly encode logical stuff and have sub-symbolic self-organizing stuff and just put them all in nodes and links in, in the same big hypergraph, as, as it turns out. And so that, that, that's a specific choice <coughs> of how to architect a system. It's not unique to OpenCog. I mean, Sam Adams' system, Joshua Blue, that was built within IBM, had, had a similar choice. I think op OpenCog has done more with this, this, this specific knowledge architecture than anyone else. And I think if, if it works well, it can have big advantages because the sub-symbolic approach has a certain flexibility and creativity to it and lets you bridge the perception and action domain with the cognition domain pretty well. But the, the, logic, the logic type approach lets you do you know, rational, logical, goal-driven thinking effectively. And people aren't so good at that, actually. I mean, we're, we're, better, we're better at that than computers are right now. But so part of my thinking here is sort of long-term and kind of... Uh, the whole future of, of intelligence focused. Because when we finally do get thinking machines that, that are, are really, really smart, then, you know, what, what, do we, what do we want out of that? Do we want to have a virtual human? Or do you want to have something that's more logical and rational and goal-oriented than, than a human? Um, I would rather have something more logical and rational and goal-oriented than a human being. And so if you build a system that has probabilistic logical inference like at, at the core, then you're, 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 more likely, you're more likely to get that. So at least that's not a guarantee, but that, that is my line of thinking. So the logical nodes and links in the system have truth values associated with them. And the, we can, we'll support a variety of different truth values, and I'll talk about that later on. But the... The most common truth values in the system has two components, which I guess since you've been hearing Perry talk about NARS, it's quite similar. It's a st strength and a confidence. The difference, or strength and a weight of evidence. The difference is that I have a probabilistic semantics for these, whereas 
pay for some reason doesn't like probability theory. But, but we'll, 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 we'll get into that later. Huh? And we also have attention values, meaning every neural link in the system has a short-term importance or STI value attached to it and a long-term importance or LTI value attached to it. And the short-term importance basically tells you how, how useful is it for the system to think about that thing in the near term. The long-term importance tells you how valuable is it for the system to keep that thing in RAM, basically. So, and both of those are updated by, by certain equations. So at each, every couple seconds or something, each neural link in the memory gets its short and long-term importance value updated. And the way that's done, I'll, I'll talk about later today or tomorrow. It's a system called economic attention allocation. Each neural link has a certain amount of virtual money that, get, that gets passed around. And if something's too poor, it gets kicked out of the mind. Right? Just like, yeah, it's, a, it's a capitalist mind, not a communist mind. Right? But there's still something to talk about here, which is nice. Right? So, acting on the atom table, which is these nodes and links, we have a bunch of different cognitive processes which sort of treat the atom table as being a different sort of memory. So we have a logic engine, probabilistic logic networks, which actually we have del deleted and are currently rebuilding from scratch. The old version still exists in some old, old branch on GitHub. A logic engine called probabilistic logic networks, which is described in a book I, I published in Springer in 2008. And that basically treats the atom space as a declarative knowledge base. We have Moses, which is, I can probably fairly say, the world's best machine learning algorithm now. We've been banging on it a lot. It's a very good piece of code. And that, that learns, it's an automated program learning algorithm. It learn, learns little programs in a Lisp-like language. And Moses, basically deals with procedure learning, learning how to do things. Then the economic attention allocation system, which spreads the short and long-term importance values around, that deals with how much attention should be paid to each, to each thing in the network. Now, episodic knowledge, we haven't, dealt, we haven't dealt with enough yet, actually, knowledge of the system's life history. But in an older version of the code base, this is something we still need to rebuild, it had like an internal simulation world where it could run, run 3D simulations in its mind's eye to run, run through its, its history of, of things that, that it, had, it had seen or that it imagined. Then sensory knowledge, we actually have a system called Destin, which is sort of like Hawkins' HGM system. It's a hierarchical temporal memory system. And one thing we're experimenting with is feedback between that and the atom space. Like you have a sub-symbolic perceptual pattern recognition system. How do you recognize patterns in that and feed them into this, into this symbolic system? So the idea in OpenCog is that all these different learning algorithms are supposed to be tuned and engineered to work together effectively on the same base of knowledge. Because I don't think any one of these approaches is, is good enough for human-level AGI. Like I, I don't think a logic engine on its own is going to do it because inference control is unsolved. I don't think automated procedure and programming alone is, is going to do it, because I don't think you'll be able to get beyond programs with like a few dozen nodes in your program tree. So you need something to piece together little programs that you've learned. And logical reasoning is, is, is good for that. I don't think this kind of hierarchical sensory pattern recognition alone is good enough, because ultimately, everything isn't best viewed as sensation. I mean, in the, in, a, in the big view, hierarchical recognition of patterns is all there is. But a specific kind of spatio-temporal pattern recognition hierarchy, like you have in Destiny or HGM, seems too restrictive to, to me. The spreading of attention around, like in an attractor neural network, that's important too. In, in, in theory, that could, could do everything. But in practice, getting like a formal logic system or full use of complex phrase structure grammar to emerge from a, an attractor neural network without some specific structure there, 
seems quite difficult, which probably is why animals besides humans have these attractor neural networks, but they can't learn complex language. I mean, we evolved something specific for the more declarative formal side of things. So what's confusing for those with a computer science background is that every one of these components here is Turn complete. Like every one of those components could make an AGI, could learn everything and do everything if you gave it enough resources. But ultimately, so what? Like, like Marcus Hunter's AIXI system could learn everything, give it enough resources, and make a couple dozen lines of Lisp code. The, th the lesson of that is that being able to do everything, given enough resources, doesn't matter. What, what matters is what you can do with the resources you actually have. And the, and the hypothesis under an open cog is that by taking a bunch of these complex algorithms and engineering them to work together effectively on the same knowledge store, you can make human level AGI work within a feasible amount of resources. And so, yeah. what, what to do it? The first choice is we have different tasks. And in certain tasks, uh, we will choose different modules to deal with. Yeah. The second is we will let all of the modules work together to deal with the same task. Yeah, that one. Yeah, that's yeah, yes, one. yes. Uh, is it necessary to? I think so. Yeah, yeah. It's difficult. So That's how your brain works. Yeah. I mean, many parts of the brain contribute to do each task. Right? Yeah. It, 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 it's, it's not like you have a, a use the phone part of the brain yeah. and then a walk down the street part of the brain or play soccer part of the brain. I mean, it, no, actually, the answer to your question is a little subtler because in, in most of the things that we have done with OpenCog now, in actual practice, most of our work has been using one component for one task. Like, I, use, I can use Moses to analyze some genetics data. I could use PLN to reason on some information that came from natural language processing, right? So we've, most of what we've done, for sake of simplicity, in practice, we have been individually using individual components. On the other hand, that's basically no AI work, and we haven't made a human level AI, AI that way, and nor has anyone else. So I think controlling an agent in the world, like a video game agent in a 3D video game world, going around doing stuff, or controlling a robot walking around in this room doing stuff, I think those tasks are ones that require all these things to work together. And if, if you, a task that I wrote about in my, my book on OpenCog, which, which I gave the PDF of, is l l let's say you have a little robot here, he's got a bunch of toys, and he's known you for a few days, and you ask him, like, build me something I've never seen before. And then the robot, it's got to build, build something it thinks I've never seen before. Now to do that requires all these things. Uh, it requires learning procedures, it requires declarative semantic knowledge, it requires sensory motor knowledge, it requires it to pay attention to something, it requires it to think about history of what events have happened in the past. So that, that involves everything, right? How to put everything in the right sequence? Well, there, it's parallel processing, right? It doesn't have to be in sequence. Uh, yeah. You've got a hundred billion neurons all working at once, right? Yeah. Yes. I mean, to some extent, Choice of physical actions is, is going to be sequential, mm -hmm. but and the kind of deliberative, reflective part of the mind is somewhat sequential because there, there's kind of bandwidth limitations and reflective consciousness. But by and large, most of the unconscious thinking is all these things acting in, in parallel on a common knowledge base, which is is somewhat like a blackboard architecture. Well, even if they work in a parallel manner, just like uh, uh, division, a company, a military organization, yeah. so they fight color, uh, they still need some cooperation, otherwise that would make some chaos or something, some bad Yeah, th th that, that's why it's hard to design an AGI yeah, system. I yeah. yeah, I mean, I've thought about that for like 20 years, so I, th I think the open card design contains a solution to that problem, but it, that, it, that is the hard problem. Is how it, and what I found is, you know, what I first hoped I could do is to like take existing things for each of these aspects and hook them together, and that, that turned out not to work very well. So we really had to design each thing just for OpenCog, and 
part of the story is that probability theory is used to glue all the components together. Like this, this program learning algorithm uses probabilistic modeling of program space. The logic uses pro pro probabilistic uncertainty. The, the attention allocation is, is based on probability estimates of how useful something is likely to be. So the language of probability theory is understood by the different modules, which is, that's not the whole solution, of course, but, but it's useful that they can all speak speak the same language in, in some sense for them to work together. But yeah, there's, but there's, in, in the book, in one of the presentations I'll show later, there's like a 16 by 16 matrix of like 16 cognitive processes and how each of them works together. But I mean, I think that's still nowhere near as complex as a textbook of neuroscience, you know, of how each of the different parts of the brain projects to the others and, and, and they all work together. I would think about is your solution uh, radically different from PACE, because you say there is some common place uh, among all of the modules, that is probabilistic, probabilistic evolutionary, probabilistic logic. PACE will say the same thing. Well, we'll have different modules with a national evolutionary learning and a national network. Here, here, here's, here's the difference, though. So, I mean, in, in PACE's approach, so there's a couple of differences. First of all, he doesn't believe in probability theory. He, he, he has a, a different way of managing uncertainty, yeah, yes. which I think doesn't work. And so that, that I mean, I've argued this with him for 20 years, but that, 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 that's one thing. And we can talk about that a bit later. And the, the other thing is, his basic representation of everything is symbolic logic. Like the, 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 the logic is the center, right? And his, his procedure learning, for example, his learning of programs and procedures is based on logic. Whereas our way of learning programs and procedures is not based on logic. It's based on evolutionary programming and information geometry and a lot of different things. So I don't want to learn, say, say a, a procedure like, say, how to serve in tennis, right? Like, ooh, how to serve a tennis ball. I don't want to learn that using logic. Yeah. I, I learn, I, this would learn that using some variant of evolutionary programming, something like, something like genetic programming with probabilistic modeling. I think logic is a bad way to learn to serve a tennis ball, mm. whether it's probabilistic logic or Nars logic, because I think logic intrinsically is step by step. And evolutionary learning, like genetic algorithms, genetic programming type stuff can take big jumps like big random jumps, then, then see, see how they work. Yeah. And now, you could, if you really wanted to, though, you could say everything is logic, but I'm going to use evolutionary programming as an inference control heuristic. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you could say all these things could be implemented as different control heuristics for a logic system. Mm -hmm. And then, in that case, you could say they're not that different. But in practice, that's not the kind of logical control heuristic that anyone ever uses, right? In practice, in a logic system, you're going step by step by step. And I think going step by step is not scalable, because it's too many steps. And then how do you control the long chain of a thousand inference steps? And you don't, you don't hit that problem when you're doing toy problems, like Tweety is a bird and a bird can fly, so Tweety can fly because these are very small, simple examples. But I think you hit that problem when the robot tries to figure out <laughs> how to get to the cafeteria on Peking University or something. So, so, yeah, I mean, in some way, everything can be wrapped into everything else, because they're all just programs on Turing machines. <laughs> but but in, in actual practice, the development pathways seem, seem to be quite different. Right, it has become apparent. I'm not going to finish this presentation before lunch. We might, we might as well have lunch and finish it after lunch, which is which is fine. Right. So, yeah, it's twelve. W w when should we come back for lunch?